I'm Barry Burbank, WBZ AccuWeather Meteorologist, and you're watching Math with Matthew. It's Math with Matthew, so go kick off your shoes, increase your worldview, it's Math with Matthew. On this episode, we welcome Beth Matthews. Steve Wurzler, Don Masidi, and the fourth grade students of Center School. And now, your host, Chelsea's Mathematics Coordinator, Dr. Matthew May Radovan. That's equals three. Welcome, welcome to Math with Matthew. I am Dr. Matthew Baranovan, the Mathematics Department Coordinator for the Chelmsford Public Schools. On our middle school episode, we shared our first music video, What is the Value of Pi, that has been seen over 23,000 times. We are now premiering our next video of Polygons Are Awesome, featuring fourth grade students from Center Elementary School. Let's take a look at the video. At right, class. Well, I don't have to tell you about the importance of polygons in geometry. At right, let's review here. We have three sides is a triangle, a four sides is a quadrilateral. What is the name of a five-sided polygon? At class. Why does learning about polygons have to be so boring? Class. Oh, who's that? I'm not expecting anybody. Sorry I'm late. I'm ready to film the open of the show. Uh, who's this? I am Matthew Bronovan, the math coordinator. Who are you? Uh, I thought I was the math coordinator. Please take a look at my badge. It says that I am the coordinator. Do you have a badge? Uh, I thought I had a badge. I, uh, I can't seem to find it though. Okay, well I need to finish taping this open for the show. Uh, okay, uh, sorry I interrupted. Thank you to Lucas Miratore, Kate Burgess, Dan Williams, Tom Peterson, Zach McIntyre, and the fourth graders from Center School for this great work on this video. On this episode of Math with Matthew, we first began learning about the district's MCAS prep program in math. Next, we learned about some of our fast fluency programs at the elementary level. And finally, we learn about how universal design for learning is incorporated in elementary math lessons. But first, let's begin by seeing each of our elementary schools.
Within the Chelmsford Public Schools, we offer MCAS prep sessions within mathematics for students in grades three through eight and grade 10. We're gonna learn a little bit about these MCAS prep sessions with one of Chelmsford's teachers and MCAS prep tutors, Mrs. Beth Matthews, grade three teacher at Harrington. Welcome to the show, Ms. Matthews. Thank you. So you've been a teacher at Harrington for eight years now? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience working within uh, Harrington and the Chelmsford Public Schools? Yes, I uh, first started teaching here at Harrington in the first grade. I did that for um, about four years, and then I moved up to third grade, and I've been here ever since. Great, so what got you wanted to be started working in the MCAS prep program? Well, there are those students that do struggle with language and understanding how to problem solve. So I thought working with a smaller group would be really beneficial to those students. Um, so what I like to do with them is really get them to understand the language portion of the MCAS test and help them decode it. Uh, they know the math piece, they understand the math concepts, it's just understanding how the questions are being asked. So I hear a little bit about the one-on-one -on -one activity as well as the decoding. What are some of the activities that you do within your MCAS prep sessions to help the students be better prepared for the exam? Well, we first start by looking at just the language portion. Words like compute are new to students in the third grade and they're not used to that type of vocabulary. So I start off by going through all the different mathematical vocabulary that they may run across during an MCAS test and we discuss how to go about solving those problems. Um, I also talk to them about just test taking strategies how on a multiple choice test there would be four choices and generally they're trying to trick us which is what I always tell mm -hmm. them and how to look at each choice and realize whether it's a possible choice meaning does it make sense so for example we do a lot of work with if I have 9 minus 17 does that actually make sense? Could you do that? Um, so we s spend some time working on those types of strategies to understand uh, what kinds of problems really will work and what solutions are possible and which ones aren't possible. So that's another thing we look at. And then we do do a lot of review of what they've learned so far in third grade. Um, obviously we go through the uh, the math program that we've taught, we review um, multiplication and rounding and um, fractions and all the different skills that they're learning in third grade. So we do review um, those skills as well. So it sounds to me that you cover all of the standards necessary within the third grade curriculum, but then you also focus on those standards for mathematical practice, like attending for precision and, and rounding and estimating and a lot of those things as well. So they're really well-rounded and well-prepared to take the exam. Exactly, and also I think it helps them to see some of the practice tests. Um, it makes them less anxious. I think they feel more prepared and as feeling more prepared, I think they'll do better on the test. Um, they'll have that confidence. Um, for some students, it's just a matter of building that confidence. Um, they don't always feel like they know what they're doing, even though they do. Um, and so going through some one-on-one -on -one with them and spending some time with them and building that confidence really helps. Now in the higher grades, we have prior year's MCAS data to be able to determine which students need that extra help. But in third grade, it's the first time they're actually taking the MCAS exam. So how do you and your other third grade colleagues uh, able to determine which students should be in the program? Well, we do have a fall benchmark test that we give right at the beginning of the year. And that does help us determine which students might need some extra help and which students, um, you know, you can continue progressing pretty quickly through the program. Uh, so that's sort of one area we look at, but we do have regular unit tests and quizzes throughout the year on all of the um, different standards that we're covering. And so through that, we usually can identify those students that do need a little extra boost. Um, and also just how they do day to day in the classroom in math, you know which students um, maybe take a little bit of time to learn a new concept. Um, and so 
through that, through all of those uh, different um, activities that happen in the classroom and test scores, that's how we determine who might need the program. And you've been teaching this program for a couple of years. Have you found the students to be successful after going through a program such as yours? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think, one, they come out confident in knowing what they need to do. Uh, they've actually gotten a chance to see some of the tests uh, from prior years, so it kind of takes the mystery out of what they're about to go through. And also that whole language piece and understanding when they read, um, read the test, they understand what they need to do to solve the problem. So I do see the scores going up just from the MCAS prep. Great. Thank you so much, Mrs. Matthews, for giving us all that information on the MCAS prep math program that we offer within the Chelmsford Public Schools. In a moment, we're going to learn more about our extra math program within the elementary schools. But first, let's go to our segment on Ask Math You. In this segment, we offer elementary parents the opportunity to ask questions of me that involve the mathematics and mathematics curriculum at the elementary level, and I answer the questions for everyone here. Let's take a look at our first question. What online resources are there for math expressions? There are two options for parents who want online resources for the math expressions program. The first is www eduplace.com, which is a free resource that requires no passwords or login. You just find the math expressions book that your child uses and you have a variety of resources. Also, there is the Think Central site that can be found on a link from the Chelmsford Public Schools homepage as well as your child's homepage to his or her school. There, there is a login that the students have and it gives parents a variety of resources to help support the mathematics curriculum. So it seems like my daughter's fourth grade math curriculum has changed this year. Is it different and in what ways? Yes, in fact, there are some small changes to the mathematics curriculum this year. Although we are still using math expressions, this is an updated version of the program that is aligned directly to the Common Core. The ideas and concepts are all the same, but it is an updated version that we'll be using for at least the next two years. I want my child to have extra help with fact fluency. What would I do? This is a great question, as many students in the lower elementary level struggle with fact fluency. And our next segment is going to focus on some of the resources that we provide to help students with fact fluency. Let's go to that right now. Welcome back. We now begin our second segment focusing on fact fluency. And we were with second grade teacher at Harrington, Mr. Wurzler. Welcome, sir. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. How long have you been teaching at Harrington? This is my 16th year. Uh, I've always been in second grade here in Harrington. And you've enjoyed it? Loved it. Excellent. Yeah. So you've done a very nice job with fact fluency within the second grade here using both the extra math program and minute math. So we want to learn about that today. Can you first start by talking to us about the extra math program? What is that? Sure. Uh, about four years ago, uh, a colleague of mine, the late Christy Martin, came to me and she was telling me about this, this uh, program that she was real enthusiastic about uh, called extra math. and. Uh, so when I started uh, learning about extra math, at the time I was involved in doing minute math. Minute math is more the paper copy where kids once a day, they'll um, solve 30 problems in about 75 seconds. And I, I get to monitor each kid's progress on an in, uh, individual level and they progress at their own rate. Well, when I started doing the extra math, the thing that was really incredible was uh, this computer program that's, that's free to the public. Um, when the kids were doing the extra math, their progress on the computer with the extra math, it parallels the same progress that they're making on the paper copy. So it's really focusing on the four basic computational skills, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, the nice thing is, is that there's all kinds of uh, alternatives to how the program works based on where a kid is, is at in their, uh, their fact fluency. For instance, some kids need a little bit more time and there's a six second program versus the regular three second program. Uh, the way that it works, as the math facts show up on the screen, the kid has three seconds to type in the right answer. If the right answer is not typed in, it'll show up on the screen. Now, is this something that's only used in second grade? Uh, no, it's, it's used throughout the district. Uh, there's, there are uh, several teachers throughout um, the elementary uh, grades that are using extra math. Um, so there are several teachers using it. And you start with addition subtraction first and once they have mastery with that they move to the multiplication division? Yeah, um, each child has to start off with the addition and while they're once they get to a hundred percent in their fact fluency with addition then they go on into subtraction and then of course they go to multiplication next and then division. And now how does this program work within your classroom? When do you use it throughout the day? Well, it starts from the minute they come in the room. We have four computers available, and uh, so we'll, in the morning, when we're doing our morning routine, there'll be four kids uh, who get started on their extra math. And then, as the day goes on, since we have a limit of four computers, we, we make sure that we find time to get all kids on the computer at least once a day doing the extra math. And in fact, uh, some kids, I have them doing it twice a day, depending on the need. Uh, a lot of my kids are already into subtraction and some in uh, multiplication and some in division, but there's some that I'd like their math fact fluency to uh, uh, continue to improve. So uh, those kids, I give them a double dose. Mm. Now it's great that you're able to get them on the computers practicing at least once a day. Can they also do it from home? Yeah. it's. Uh, um, the way that I set it up is over the summer, before well, actually before we end the school year, I send home a, uh, a sheet that, so the parents will know how to log on. And uh, I, when I contact the parents, I help them to get logged on to make sure they're all set so that by the time we start the beginning of the year, um, just about all of my kids have already had some exposure to doing extra math. Um, and so it's part of their nightly homework. Of the f uh, four nights of the week that we have homework, three of those nights they're required to do extra math. And, uh, you know, it really makes a big difference. You know, by the time the kids come to third grade, I really want my kids to know their math facts. Mm -hmm. Well, I see you have a very elaborate uh, management system of all this data from the extra math. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how you gather this data and how it's used to uh, drive instruction and, and knowledge of fact fluency? Sure. Um, what I do is uh, on Saturdays I'll, I'll go, go on my computer at home and I can access and pull up the uh, progress of the entire class. And I, I pull up their progress that they're making at home, the progress they're making at school, and then I have a separate spreadsheet where I uh, keep track of who's currently working on addition, who's working on subtraction, who's working on multiplication, and who's working on division. Now something else we use along with our math program is uh, in each desk there's math flashcards so they're constantly using the math flashcards and I try to make sure that if, if a child needs most of their uh, math flat fact fluency practice in addition that they're focusing in that area to complement where they're at with the extra math and where they're at with the minute math. That's a nice way to differentiate the different needs of the learners in your classroom as well as where their skill set is. Yeah um, and the thing is is that Everybody continues to make progress, and they make it at their own pace. But uh, you know, I, I really feel like by the time they finish second grade, they really are in a good spot with their math facts. And uh, you know, it's 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 great to see because it does work. Wow, this is very impressive how you're able to again meet all the needs of your students, focusing on fact fluency, which we always hear from third and fourth grade teachers that many of their students don't have. So I applaud you and your efforts doing this. Thank you. Excellent. So thank you so much for taking some time to share with us your fact fluency and learning more about the extra math program that we use. What we're going to do is we're going to take a moment and look at a brief clip from the new episode of Ion Park Season 2 and then we'll be right back at Byam School as we're going to learn about the fourth grade program there. And we begin with the fastest finger question to determine who's going to come up and play the game. 
Put these rational numbers in order from least to greatest. 3 fourths, 85 hundredths, 65 percent, and 1 half. And now, let's see the correct answers in order. It is 1 half, 65 percent, 3 fourths, and 85 hundredths. Let's see who got the correct answer in the shortest time. It's Jackie! Congratulations, Jackie! Welcome back. Within the Chelmsford Public Schools, we use the universal design for learning among all grade levels and subjects. Today, we're going to learn about how we use the universal design for learning within mathematics at the elementary school with Mrs. Dawn Masidi, grade four teacher at Byam. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Great. So talk to us first, what is UDL? So UDL stands for Universal Design for Learning. It's a set of teaching principles that can be built into lessons um, to anticipate where students might have misunderstandings um, regarding the concept that you're teaching. And ideally, a teacher is able to build in um, certain aspects to the lesson to try to avoid those pitfalls. So um, a good UDL lesson includes three parts. It it offers students uh, multiple ways to access the same information, the same content. It offers students um, choice in how they express their own understanding of the concept. And it, um, it emphasizes having s multiple ways of students staying engaged in the lesson. Great. So how did you get involved with UDL? So I originally learned about UDL through uh, a course that was offered to Chelmsford teachers. Uh, I took the course two summers ago with Katie Novak and learned about strategies for um, implementing UDL in all of my lessons, um, but today I'll focus on how I use them in math. All right, so let's talk about the mathematics. What does a math lesson look like that has UDL embedded in it? So, um, if I were to teach a typical UDL lesson, I would try to implement some part of each of the three principles. So, I might begin the lesson um, by using a YouTube clip or some other engaging kind of hook to get the kids invested in what we're doing, um, get them interested, pique their curiosity a little bit. Um, I would then try to build in some choice into the lesson. So I might give the kids some choice in whether they work independently or work with a small group or work with a partner, um, often give them the choice to work at a, sm a small table with me to, for a little bit of extra support if that's what they need. Um, it might be as simple as offering the kids the choice between using grid paper or a whiteboard. And just a little, a little um, choice like that can actually make the difference for some kids about how invested they stay in the lesson. Um, and then finally, I would try to um, keep the kids in engaged by using some kind of hands-on, manipulative technology, something that gets them interested and keeps them interested throughout the course of the lesson. Yeah, it really sounds like you're able to differentiate the lesson as well as keeping the kids engaged by using some of these principles of UDL. Yeah, that's the goal. Excellent. So you also get some equipment um, into your classroom by taking this UDL course. Can you share with us what you have? Yep. So as a result of taking the course, I um, was kind of put on the track to get uh, an interactive whiteboard in my classroom that we use every day. Um, and then I got the technology that goes with it, the computer that's compatible with the interactive whiteboard. So it's really kind of given me some motivation to learn more about technology and how I can use it to meet the needs of my kids. All right, so let's focus on the lesson that you're teaching today. Can you tell us a little bit about what the lesson is? Yes, so in the Math Expressions program, there's a character, a very beloved character named the Puzzled Penguin. Um, he's built into some of the lessons, but he's, he's in the student's workbook. and. The lessons get a little bit tedious after a while. The kids get a little bit sick of the puzzled penguin because they know they have to write a lot to explain their thinking about how to correct his mistakes. Um, so what I did was try to bring the puzzled penguin to life. So we have our little penguin friend here. Um, I've, <laughs> I've searched the internet for videos that would um, kind of get the kids involved. And one of the things I found was a very, very funny video of penguins falling. Um, penguins falling on rocks, penguins falling on beaches, in the water. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that by sharing that with the students before we begin and demonstrating how penguins make mistakes in all areas, not just math, that it will make the kids laugh, get them invested, and make them want to find out more about what they can do to help this little penguin friend of ours. And so each student will receive um, a little card that looks like this. 
It's a puzzled penguin card, and it has a mistake in adding or subtracting mixed numbers that the students have been working on, but we've seen a lot of common errors. Um, and by making those same mistakes through the puzzle penguin, it gives them a chance to correct those mistakes and teach another person <laughs> how to um, avoid those mistakes in the future when it's really just the penguin and nobody's feelings get hurt. <laughs> It seems like a great way to really get the kids involved and engaged in the lesson as they're trying to learn about something like mixed numbers, which exactly. is not the most exciting concept. <laughs> exactly. And I think that when it's, when it's them making the mistakes, they get tired of hearing how they should fix it. But when they have the chance to be the teacher, in a sense, and to work with this little penguin who's their new little friend, um, it takes away a little bit of the intimidation factor, and it, it lets them focus on what's really important. And you feel by using some of these principles of UDL within the math lessons, it's made you a stronger teacher and help with student learning? Absolutely. One of the things that I find is that if you get the kids invested in the lesson from the beginning and keep them engaged throughout the lesson, they're more likely to persevere in, pro in problem solving and solving the problem that we had in the first place. Um, and so I do see that when students are engaged through these principles, they, they have a higher success rate. They have a better chance of understanding at the end what the concept was that they were introduce to in the beginning. And that's so important, not just the memorization of the concept, but truly understanding it yeah. so they retain it long term. Yeah, the follow through is very important. Great, excellent. Well, thank you so much for that information on UDL and how it's used within the mathematics classrooms at the elementary level. We're going to end the show by seeing one more time the song Polygons Are Awesome. I want to thank all of our guests for being on the show, Mr. Tom Peterson and everyone at CTM. Thanks for our third episode of Math with Matthew. At right, class. Well, I don't have to tell you about the importance of polygons in geometry. At right, let's review here. We have three sides is a triangle, a four sides is a quadrilateral. What is the name of a five-sided polygon? At class. Why does learning about polygons have to be so boring? Oh, who's that? I'm not expecting anybody. Living the polygon way. Peace. When they're drawn nice and wide